Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a couple of comic books and this is a two issue uh, comic series basically, uh, which is the official adaptation that Marvel Comics did of the movie Blade Runner. These were released in 1982 to accompany the film. And uh, I bought these because I was fascinated with this movie. And uh, so I'm very excited to still have these in my collection. They're not in the greatest of condition, but I want to walk you through uh, each of these books and show you um, how fantastic the artwork is in these and also uh, show you how it sort of differs from the actual movie. So we'll start over here with issue number one. And you can see on the back, uh, there's a original vintage advertising from the time period. So you can see Parker Brothers Atari video game uh, system compatible cartridge that you could buy for The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, this was two years uh, after the release of Empire, uh, but that uh, movie was such a huge, um, you know, box office phenomenon that, uh, and Star Wars was becoming just even more popular than it was uh, initially. So you'd see a lot of stuff related to Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back. But uh, getting into this book, uh, basically you can see uh, here we have uh, the opening scene. Uh, with the flying cars going over top of the city. Also, you can see uh, credited here are the various artists who worked on this. Al Williamson, uh, Carlos Garzon. Uh, so, yeah, uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, the artwork in this is very fantastic, as you'll see as we're going through this. Uh, and then we get this uh, opening scene where Leon is being interviewed by Holden. And what I noticed in reading this is that the dialogue is actually uh, quite a bit different from the movie itself. Um, I'm guessing uh, when this comic book was written, they were going off of probably either a shooting script or perhaps the dialogue as it appeared in the novelization. As you can see, uh, this is the introduction of uh, the Deckard character. And you'll notice uh, in here, there's uh, little panels where he's sort of narrating and it says, that's how it ended for Holden. It began for me. So, uh, it's interesting because the original theatrical release of Blade Runner had uh, Harrison Ford doing sort of narration as well. So in later editions of uh, Blade Runner, that voiceover was removed. But in the theatrical release, uh, you can hear him sort of uh, doing uh, a narration of, uh, you know, his observations um, over top of uh, the actual movie dialogue. So, and as you can see he, here, he's ordering food. And this is the point at which he gets interrupted by uh, Gaff, who comes up behind him, and, uh, you know, tries to grab him and take him to see uh, Bryant back at the police headquarters. So, and as you can see, uh, the dialogue is, um, you know, it's similar to what's done in the movie, but not exact. And then you can see them taking off in the police spinner. So it's very cool. And here we have uh, them in the, in the actual car flying and again they're talking in the movie there is no dialogue between those two in the car so again uh, it differs from the movie and then here you can see them entering the police station again it's interesting because the some of the camera angles and stuff are different from the way it appears in the movie so um, I'm wondering um, what exactly they were going off in terms of reference uh, they must have had footage from the movie to look at but again, because the dialogue is different, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, what exactly they were looking at when they were creating this comic book. So it's all kind of interesting to see see the various differences between, you know, what's what's depicted here versus what we actually saw in the movie. So on this page, uh, basically, is the depiction of the meeting between uh, Bryant and Deckard, and then in the background, you can see. Gav is doing his little origami sculpture. Uh, I believe actually here he's doing the unicorn, um, which is different from what actually appears in the film. So again, uh, differences between these things is uh, interesting. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe uh, they might have been going off of uh, storyboards or something like that in terms of, you know, the various camera angles and so forth. Uh, so uh, Bryant is explaining the problem, you know, that there were these replicants uh, who had gotten loose and it actually depicts uh, you know what they had actually done um, you know in terms of you know, these horrible things so uh, that's pretty cool because this this is uh, obviously not in the movie uh, but it's cool to actually see a frame 
that depicts, uh, you know, what, what Roy Batty and his followers were up to. So that's all very cool. And then uh, down here, we're back in the car, flying uh, through the city. Again, fantastic artwork uh, in this issue. Uh, as you can see, he's flying over to uh, Tyrell Corporation, and then you see him in the room with the uh, artificial owl, and then uh, Rachel appears from behind, and you see the dialogue between those is, again, different from it is in the movie. Dr. Tyrell comes in, and basically you get the wide shot, uh, which uh, this does very much uh, mirror what we see in the movie, so that's pretty cool. He brings out the Voight comp test, uh, so he can test Rachel, and uh, he obviously asks her a bunch of questions, and then determines that she is a replicant. Again, Dr. Terrell says, I'm impressed. Um, so uh, this was sort of a uh, test to see, uh, not only if the void comp test would actually work, but also uh, to sort of, you know, show off in a way, you know, the fact that you know, Rachel is a Nexus 6, and she's far more sophisticated than any of the other replicants that they had produced before. Um, so, and she's unaware that she is a replicant. So, as you can see, there's dialogue back and forth here between Deckard and Dr. Terrell. And then, once again, he's off to do more investigating in terms of tracking down the various replicants. And again, more, uh, more vintage advertisement inside this comic book. So, and then over here, uh, you have uh, Gaff and Deckard actually entering into this apartment uh, where they're uh, looking for some evidence about uh, the whereabouts of these uh, replicants. And uh, it's in this apartment where he discovers the photographs, uh, which he later does analysis on uh, back at his apartment. And up here, uh, you can see uh, the introduction of Roy where he's having a conversation uh, with Leon about uh, their situation. And then they're walking through the street. And then they enter into this laboratory uh, where this genetic designer is actually working on eyes for the various replicants, including the Nexus 6 models, uh, which uh, Roy and Leon are both a part of. So, yeah, uh, cool stuff. And I really love the close-ups on the characters' faces and so forth. And here's more of the scene, basically, where uh, they're trying to question this guy, uh, but he really doesn't have uh, the answers that they're looking for. Uh, and they threaten his life, and he basically uh, gives up the name of uh, J.F. Sebastian as a person they can talk to about, uh, you know, possibly extending their life beyond their four-year lifespan. So then we cut back to Deckard, and uh, he finds uh, Rachel back at his apartment building and uh she's uh questioning um you know what's going on uh because uh, uh she'd basically been you know sort of outcast from from Terrell corporation after it was revealed uh through the test that she is a replicant and she's uh, convinced that she's not and uh you know tries to show evidence of her childhood to Deckard, uh, but of course he knows for sure that she is a replicant and that um, the the memories that she has are actually implants uh, and they're not they're not re real memories they're actually memories of uh, Terrell's niece. So then uh, Rachel leaves and basically drops uh, her photo to the floor uh, you know sort of um, being convinced uh, by Deckard that she is a replicant and that her entire past history is a lie. So, a uh, very dramatic scene in the movie and, uh, you know, kind of abbreviated here in the comic book form, but uh, still very cool in terms of uh, the way they rendered out the artwork and everything. Looks really cool. So next we cut to another part of the city uh, where we were introduced to J.F. Sebastian, who discovers uh, Pris sort of in a garbage pile uh, outside of his uh, apartment. So, and she sort of pretends to be like a homeless person and uh, he invites her inside, you know, trying to help her out. So it's all, uh, you know, a mastermind infiltration operation though. So uh, they really want to um, get information from Sebastian in terms of, you know, how to extend their lifespan beyond the four years. 
And entering into uh, J.F. Sebastian's place, uh, we see some of the genetically designed sort of, uh, you know, little people that he's created uh, as his companions. And, uh, you know, Pris is trying to be, you know, as nice as possible uh, so that she can get on his good side. Uh, then we cut to uh, back at Deckard's apartment where he's uh, going to do the uh, photo analysis. And then here we see a scene uh, that's not in the movie. Um, he's at the noodle bar uh, and talking about the fish scales uh, because uh, one of the things he had picked up uh, when he was at Leon's apartment was the uh, scale that he found uh, in the tub. So he takes that to uh, a place to get it analyzed and they determine that it's not a fish scale but actually a snake scale. And then he goes to see uh, the creator of the snakes and try and figure out uh, who he sold the snakes to. Um, so he gives up some information, uh, which leads him to uh, Taffy Lewis's bar. Uh, basically, he confronts Taffy and uh, doesn't find any information. And uh, here uh, we can see him making the phone call to Rachel, uh, you know, trying to invite her out to meet so they can um, socialize, basically. And uh, she turns down that request, uh, basically hangs up on him. And then uh, here you can see him confronting Zora, uh, who is a performer at Taffy Lewis's, and she obviously has the artificial snake with her. So all the pieces are sort of coming together in terms of um, tracking down these various replicants. And uh, so he, he kind of pre pretends to be uh, something that he's not in order to have a conversation with her, uh, but she quickly turns the tables on him and attacks him and it ends up being a pursuit uh, through the city streets uh, and Deckard is sort of chasing her as she's jumping over cars and so forth and um, all this is very dramatic in the movie too uh, definitely one of my favorite scenes as he's uh, trying to uh, confront Zora and she's very fast but not quite fast enough uh, because eventually he does catch up with her and shoots her as she's you know barreling through this uh, sort of depart department store and smashing through various windows and then you can see her on the ground here uh, after the aftermath of this uh, encounter and uh, I, I do like the way they did the artwork of the scene uh, very much captures uh, the way it looks in the film and then here we here we can see uh, after the incident um, basically you can see Rachel in the crowd uh, so she did eventually come out uh, to meet up with Deckard uh, or maybe she was just out um, you know, out of curiosity. And then at, at some point, uh, Leon sneaks up on Deckard and, uh, cause he had been watching, uh, from the distance, the whole scene going on with Zora. And, uh, so he basically is here to, uh, attack Deckard. And then it says, uh, to be continued. So that's pretty much it for the first issue. Uh, and you can see more, more vintage advertisements in here. And, uh, so that's issue one. So uh, let's get started and take a look at the second issue. So here we have the second issue, and on the cover uh, you can see the sort of dramatic scene uh, as depicted uh, near the end of the film. So that's very cool. Uh, I always love the cover artwork on uh, comic books. They, they really sort of, uh, you know, take full advantage of the fact that this is the first thing you're going to see and incentivizes uh, buying the comic book in the first place. And here we have opening up on the confrontation again between uh, Leon and Deckard. So, uh, and this uh, isn't going to go very well. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty terrifying. Uh, he knocks the gun out of his hand. And uh, just as it seems like uh, Leon is going to uh, end Deckard, uh, Rachel had picked up the gun and basically was able to shoot uh, Leon and uh, basically saves uh, Deckard's life. So, uh, yeah, now, now, like, he owes her a life debt, so it's all the more important uh, that he uh, not fulfill the mission of uh, eliminating all the replicants. And uh, here we see the meeting between um, Bryant and Deckard in the street, and uh, Bryant basically informs him that uh, Rachel is on the run, and so his mission is uh, more complicated now because there's pressure from the police for him to hunt down and uh, you know get rid of Rachel as well because 
she's uh, considered just as much of a threat as the other Nexus 6 models. So here we are back at Deckard's apartment, and he's sort of recovering from the, the whole incident with Zora, uh, where he got uh, pretty badly beat up. And there's a conversation going on back and forth uh, between Rachel and Deckard about, um, you know, what his intentions are uh, with her, uh, if, um, you know, he's going to, uh, you know, end up having to retire her. And, uh, you know, he basically assures her that, no, uh, that he owes her because uh, she saved his life. So, and then we have a sort of romantic encounter between the two of them. And this, this whole sequence is, is very dramatic in the film, and you definitely feel a, a very good chemistry between the two actors in the scene. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's so much about this film that I really uh, enjoy, and it is uh, essentially uh, one of my favorite films of all time. We cut back to uh, J.F. Sebastian and the two other replicants, Roy and Pris, and uh, they're basically, you know, trying to convince him to help them and they eventually reveal that they are replicants he actually figures it out uh, because of their mannerisms and the fact that they they had a level of perfection uh, which was exceeding uh, what normal humans would have so uh, and they're trying to charm him and convince him to uh, to help them extend their lifespan beyond the four years and uh, uh, he basically doesn't have a solution for them and really it's only Dr. Terrell who could possibly help them uh, you know adjust their lifespan so that they could live longer and then we got this nice uh, panoramic view of the flying cars over the city so really love this it, it does sort of uh, you know expand it out so you, you kind of get a full view of like what the movie experience is very much like and as you can see here uh, this is Roy and J.F. Sebastian in the elevator as they're going up the side of the building to meet with Dr. Terrell. More vintage advertising. And then here we have uh, Dr. Terrell. And uh, you can see um, uh, Roy had come up with a uh, checkmate solution for the chess game that was going on between Dr. Terrell and J.F. Sebastian. So uh, he agrees to meet with him. Uh, as a result of winning the game. And then uh, we cut back to Deckard in the street uh, with his non-flying car that uh, goes on the ground, although still very modern kind of looking. Um, you know, it's sort of uh, futuristic, but not, not as futuristic as the flying ones. And then you can see he tries to call up uh, J.F. Sebastian on the, the video phone, and uh, uh, Pris answers the phone and hangs up on him. So he knows there's something going on, so uh, he has to head over to J.F. Sebastian's place and figure out exactly what's happening. And then we see uh, the encounter between Roy and Dr. Terrell, and uh, this obviously isn't going to go well because uh, Dr. Terrell explains to him that there really is no way to extend their lifespan. Uh, once, once it's been established, uh, you really can't make a change and so they're basically going to die when their four years is up and Terrell tries to convince him that uh, he should revel in his time you know that he's uh, you know sort of a super being uh, but that's not good enough for Roy and Roy ends up uh, murdering Dr. Terrell and eventually he murders uh, J.F. Sebastian as well so that happens off screen though you don't actually see uh, J.F. Sebastian uh, getting killed the same way that Terrell does. So, and then we cut back to Deckard. Um, as you can see, he's he's arrived at J.F. Sebastian's place, and you can see the, the little people, the little replicants that he's uh, created. And then uh, Pris is sort of trying to hide underneath this veil, uh, sort of acting as if she's part of uh, uh, Sebastian's collection of replicants. And, uh, you know, Deckard is curious. He thinks there's something up, so he pulls off the veil, and then all of a sudden he's being attacked by Pris, and she does a number on him uh, using her acrobatics. But in the end, uh, Deckard pulls out his weapon and shoots her, and she falls dead on the ground. Has this sort of uh, weird spasmatic attack as she's dying. One of the more more disturbing scenes is actually in the film 
is the death of Pris. So, uh, yeah, it's all kind of uh, coming to uh, fruition in terms of Deckard both completing his mission, but also um, leading up to where he has to confront Roy. So Roy basically arrives, and Deckard is there waiting for him. Uh, and then we get this back and forth sort of dialogue sequence and also action where uh, Roy's arm bursts through the wall. He grabs Deckard's hand, uh, the one that's holding the gun. He, he breaks two of his fingers and he said, uh, this is for Zora and this is for Pris. And so he's uh, taunting Deckard, uh, injuring him a little bit to make it so that uh, the odds are more even. Because Deckard has gun and Roy has nothing. So it's sort of like, you know, um, it's, it's sort of weird that, uh, you know, Roy um, feels it necessary to sort of torture Deckard in the process of, uh, you know, this confrontation back and forth. Uh, the chase sort of continues and you can see uh, Deckard sort of climbing uh, to try and get away from from Roy, and then again, Roy's head bursts through the wall of sort of this uh, tiled, um, I think it's like a bathroom or a kitchen, and then, uh, you know, he has a, a direct uh, conflict with uh, Deckard. Uh, Deckard tries to hit him with like a crowbar or something, and then you can see uh, Deckard uh, climbs out the window and basically is trying to get away from uh, Roy in any way he can, and uh, he says, he keeps calling him little man, um, sort of uh, this superiority complex of the Nexus 6 models in particular uh, because of their sort of superhuman abilities also you know they, they have built in sort of this arrogance uh, at least uh, the group that um, launched into all these attacks and caused the problems uh, Roy and his uh, followers you know have sort of this uh, better than everybody else attitude so and the chase continues up onto the roof and as you can see, uh, Deckard tries to jump across uh, to another building, but he kind of misses, and then he's ha dangling from this uh, little piece of architecture. And Roy makes the jump very easily, and then um, it looks as though, uh, you know, Deckard is going to fall to his death, but then at the last minute, Roy grabs his arm, pulls him up, and then uh, throws him out of the roof, and then you get this dramatic scene where uh, Roy is at his end, and you know he gives the the memorable speech, uh, you know where he says, "I've seen things you people wouldn't believe: attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate." You know, and and again, the dialogue is a little bit different here um, than it is in the movie, but uh, you know, the result is the same. He's uh, going to die. He says. All those moments will be lost, like tears in the rain, time to die. So, and Deckard is just watching him as his life is coming to an end. And then uh, Gaff shows up and, you know, explains to him, you know, uh, it's too bad she won't live, but then again, who does? So uh, this is sort of a, a veiled threat, uh, it seems like, to Deckard. So he immediately heads back to his apartment to find Rachel, and initially he thinks, um, you know, that she might be dead, but she's still alive, and so he's determined to try and, you know, help her escape. Um, they say that they love each other, and uh, so um, they head out of the apartment, and that's the point at which uh, he finds Gaff's calling card, the uh, little unicorn. So, and then uh, uh, they show an extra scene um, here where there's like mountaintops and so forth where they've they've headed north and uh, eventually escaped uh, from from the city. It is interesting to note that in the original theatrical cut there, do, there is an extra scene with uh, Rachel and Deckard in the car um, you know driving away and uh, in later editions of Blade Runner the ones that are available now the director's cut and so forth that part is eliminated. Uh, they get into the elevator and then it cuts to credits. So there's quite a bit of difference between uh, the way the film was depicted in the theater versus, uh, you know, the way it, Ridley Scott really wanted it to, to appear. So, so certain changes have been made with this movie over time. And uh, 
I think uh, Ridley wanted the, the ending to be much more uncertain, uh, whereas uh, it's probably pressure from the studio that uh, made it so that they had to have sort of a uh, resolution at the end of the film where, you know, they were in a lot less danger and it's uh, implied that they escaped. So that's pretty much it for this comic book. Again, more more vintage ads, and uh, on the back there's a Lego ad for uh, what they call um, uh, Expert Builder, uh, which n we now know as Technic uh, Lego sets. So uh, this was the beginning of the, the more complex version of Lego uh, that's very commonly used today uh, across all Lego sets, uh, but at the time this was sort of a new thing. So a uh, great comic book and really happy to have uh, both these issues uh, still in my collection. I think, uh, you know, the cover art is fantastic and as well as uh, all the artwork inside. And it gives uh, a chance to, you know, see the movie in a whole new way uh, because the dialogue is different and uh, certain scenes are in there that aren't in the movie. So it's pretty cool uh, overall as an experience to uh, sort of look at... Um, you know, Blade Runner through the eyes of Marvel Comics. That's pretty much all I have for you today. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more reviews of Marvel Comics in the future, think about subscribing to the channel because I will be doing more of this in the future. Until next time, I hope you're having a great day and thanks for watching.